Hello and welcome to my video on East Germany. Um, my last one got deleted when I got hacked, so I am remaking it. So one of the most common arguments I hear against socialism is when people try and compare East and West Germany. They'll usually point to the West and say, look how great the economy is with capitalism, then point to the East and say, look how awful things are with socialism. Doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the East and West Germany's out of historical context, however, is very misleading. So let's dive into the real story behind the GDR. The first thing you'll hear people claim is how much better the East will, or the West was than the East. So let's explore this notion a little further. Let's start by taking a look at the real at the GDR, which is East Germany, is real income per capita. And it should be noted that real income per capita in the GDR was already trailing the West before its establishment, mostly because of reparation payments it had to make shortly after World War II, and despite faster real economic growth in East Germany as well as most of Eastern Europe compared to the West, it had not yet caught up with the West German level by 1989. In particular, in 15 years after World War II, the Soviet Union extracted 50 billion more marks in reparations from East Germany than West Germany. Even more recent figures put that estimate at over 100 billion marks, which was several times larger than the GDR's own national output at the time. So you really cannot expect the GDR to be doing as well as the West in that regard, given their circumstance. Yes, it is true that the West also made war reparation payments related to Nazi Germany's atrocities and war defeat, including compensation to war victims. However, these were largely offset by the Marshall Plan aid given to West Germany by the USA shortly after World War II. Just think, if East Germany had instead been able to invest the 100 billion marks they were forced to pay in reparations starting in 1953 and return and reinvesting all capital and earnings each year at its average 18% rate of return on investment, it would have compounded to give East Germans an income per capita equal to about 15 times the level of West Germany's in 1989. We can arrive at this by assuming that an average payment of 2 billion marks per year beginning in 1953 were invested at 18% instead of paid out for war-related crimes and debts, and assuming that earnings, based on the same 18% interest rate from the capital accumulated after 36 years were paid out in 1989 and each year after that, West German income per capita would have been only about one third higher. Comparing this figure to the per capita East German figures estimated to have existed without reparations, it indicates East German per capita income in 1989 to still have been far higher at five to ten times that of West German income per capita. Instead, however, the enormous reparations caused East German income per capita to be only about two-fifths that of the West in, in the 1950s, although it had risen to two-thirds of the West level by 1989. It was, the, it was this discrepancy in income per capita arising from differences in reparations that had caused East Germany to build the Berlin Wall in 1961 in order to prevent its skilled workers, such as essential doctors and nurses, from being bought by the West Germans. Which would have, which would offer, and the West German employees or employers would offer much higher wages and also many benefits, as I will explain later in this video. In fact, before the Berlin Wall was erected, several million East Germans, um, several million East Germans, especially skilled workers like doctors and engineers, moved to West Germany for the higher incomes available there, and this migration resulted in a huge loss to the East German economy. Besides the large net migrations of people, black market activities and outright sabotage by both the CIA and West German government also helped motivate the building of the wall. Given that East German income would have been higher than in West Germany without the reparation payments, one can clearly see that it would not have been necessary for East Germany to build the Berlin Wall if only the West had made its fair share of reparation payments for Nazi Germany's war crimes. Had the West paid as much as the East, the burden to East Germany would have been enormously reduced and would have allowed its income to be substantially higher. 
At the same time, West Germany's income would have been reduced by making its share of the payments. In this situation, East Germany would not have had to have longer work weeks, since it would not have been necessary to catch up with the West, nor to have such severe shortages that could have been alleviated with greater wealth, nor to spend so little on pollution control that reflected East Germany's relative poverty, nor to restrict political freedoms that East Germany did not want um, the reason that they did that was because East Germany did not want uh, the richer West Germans to take advantage of their political system, nor to have such an obnoxious secret police whose primary purpose was to keep the East Germans from leaving the country for the greater witches, riches of the West. Almost all accusations about how repressive and terrible East Germany was can be traced back to how the country was treated post-war. Let's continue by taking a look at how the GDR actually functioned. While also keeping in mind what I discussed previously about how worse off the GDR was post-war compared to the West. So the first benefit that the GDR offered to its citizens was a right to work. So the right to work at a job of one's own choosing was guaranteed by the East German constitution. While there were some people, mostly alcoholics and drug addicts, who continuously refused to show up for jobs offered by the state, their numbers represented only about 0.2% of the entire East German workforce and only 0.1% of scheduled work hours for the rest of the labor force was lost due to unexcused absences. These um, findings are especially important in regard to the whole incentive argument, given that the that people were, for the most part, protected from being fired slash penalized for failing to show up or for not working productively. And yet they did so anyways. This basic right to work was so enjoyed by the people of the GDR that a 1999 survey of Eastern Germans indicated about 70% of them felt they had much more job security and much more satisfactory work in the GDR than they do in modern Germany. Another thing the GDR handled much better than the West was inflation. While there were slight average annual inflation rates of 0.5% in the aggregate economy between 1960 and 1989, prices for consumer goods were held constant over the 1960 to 1989 interval. Even the inflation rate in um, the aggregate economy was 0% in East Germany's final decade, as admitted by the final East German statistics. While West German propagandists like Schwarze 1999 admit that East German aggregate uh, counts were just as accurate as West German ones, they often try to fabricate inflation in East Germany by citing the depreciation of the East German currency in the 1980s on the black markets or in the context of a very narrowly traded basket of goods. Basing an aggregate inflation rate on such prices of a limited amount of goods in a very narrow market is not only absurd and obviously an attempt at slander, but it is also totally inconsistent with the data on East German aggregate purchasing power as reported by the West German government and various West German banks, which further prove the East German inflation figures to be accurate and not fabricated. Another thing East, the GDR offered its citizens was a right to higher education. In the GDR, there was no tuition for college, and a living allowance was provided by the state to students without any further debt obligations. In fact, the educational system in the GDR worked so well that only a small minority of East Germans feel that the educational system is better today in unified Germany, whereas far more Eastern Germans more than double believe the educational system under socialism was superior. In East Germany, crime rates were also much lower in comparison to the West, which may have had something to do with the fact that illegal drugs were almost non-existent in the GDR, but regardless, murder and violence were very rare, and theft was much less prevalent than in most capitalist countries. This is even more of a great achievement when taking into consideration the GDR's socio-economic conditions at that time. For example, in 1988, there were seven criminal acts per thousand residents in East Germany compared to 71 per thousand and residents in West Germany. As a result, a 1999 survey of, of Eastern Germans indicated that 81% felt less secure from crime in the unified capitalist Germany than in socialist East Germany. Even American women visiting East Germany in the 1980s were astounded that they could actually walk the streets alone at night without any fear. The GDR also offered many more rights to women and children. Women had initial access to jobs, at least jobs that were of the same stature of men. Although family considerations and other factors may have resulted in them not advancing as far as males later in life. Regardless, 
Female employees were about three times more likely to hold steady jobs in East Germany than working women in West Germany. A paid maternity leave of six months was also available after the birth of the first child and up to one year for the second child. The maternity leave increased to 18 months for the third child and all subsequent children. The last thing I'll mention is the fact that the, um, the tax rate in the GDR was much more fair as well as much simpler than the West's. The state withheld about 15% from wages, up to a maximum of 25% for high wage earners, without the need for fi filing a tax reform or tax form. On the other hand, for private companies which could exist with 10 or fewer employees, taxes on profits were alleviated at a steady progressive rate that reached 90% for income over 250,000 marks, which was about $150,000 at official exchange rates. These are just some of the many things the GDR did that made them a preferable country to live in when accounting for their conditions. A claim often given by rightists and just people who believe in Western propaganda in general is that there was no political freedom in the, in the GDR, or at least that there wasn't nearly as much of it as there was in the West. However, this claim is contradicted by reality when one does some basic research into the matter. The West German system created the illusion of a liberal democracy by publicly allowing the formation of different political parties. At first sight, this appeared to compare favorably with the GDR, where one needed to obtain permission to form from the government to start a new political party. However, the West German government can and has outlawed many peaceful political parties and organizations that are not perceived to be consistent with the capitalist order, such as numerous pacifist groups and a fairly popular West German Communist Party in the 1950s. Thus, despite the illusion of greater political freedom in, East, in West Germany, there is very little difference in practice between East Germany's requirement to to obtain permission to form a political party and West Germany's right to disallow any political parties or organizations it chooses. That and the West German system creates more risks to founder activists with respect to expending the time and money in order to start up an organization that is only later ruled to be forbidden. An example of West Germany forcibly conform. Uh, forcing conformity in politics can be seen when the former Communist Party of East Germany relabeled the Party of Democratic Socialism and the Socialist Unity Party in anticipation of reunification revised its platform to meet the constitutional requirements of the unified Germany that were the same as in West Germany. West Germany also prohibited, uh, appeared freer with respect to making or writing statements about the government. But there were laws in West Germany that prohibit slander from government rulers, just as such laws existed in East Germany, but were rarely enforced there. In addition, although demonstrations are widely thought of as being tolerated in West Germany, there is substantial evidence of police and social repression of demonstrations in West Germany. On the other hand, the massive peaceful demonstrations in the GDR in the fall of 1989 indicate substantially less repression there than is normally assumed, and dissent on particular issues was freely allowed in East Germany insofar as petitions could be, and often were, collected and sent to the East German government for action. In fact, the rights of citizens to protest against government policies and against government bureaucrats or politicians was fairly widespread in not only the GDR, but all of Eastern Europe, and the socialist systems not only allowed such protests, but actually encouraged them to reduce the occurrence of, quote, departments departures from legality, arbitrary acts, and abuse of power by agencies of public administration. It should also be understood that in capitalist West Germany, only the rich had sufficient money to make their statements or writings sufficiently publicized to have a widespread effect on the opinion of others, and it has been a well-established that West German elections are controlled by marketing, money, and personalities, as they are always are under capitalist systems. Another way the West the West repressed political opposition was by making sure that communists were legally not allowed to have jobs in West German government bureaucracy and West German businesses being um, 
invariably owned by rich anti-communists, often follow the government's example, thereby virtually prohibiting working people from publicly stating communist opinions in capitalist West Germany. A, mo a more general form of extortion also existed and still somewhat exists insofar as rich capitalists often threatened to eliminate jobs by taking capital out of the country if a socialist government was elected, and this threat of unemployment was, and still is, made very clear to the working masses in capitalist societies. Despite these facts, and despite the fact that the established ruling West German political parties are widely perceived to be clubs for a political class that makes its own rules, West German elections are still generally considered to be more democratic than East German ones in the mainstream history books. Regardless, it should be known that East Germany also had many political parties, however they voluntarily formed into the United National Front shortly after World War II to create a coalition bloc designed to prevent a re-election of the capitalist Nazis. East Germany also permitted voters to cast secret ballots and always had more than one candidate for each government position. Although election results typically resulted in over 90% of all votes being casted for the casted for candidates or parties that did not favor revolutionary changes in the East German system, just as West German elections results generally resulted in over 90% of the people voting for non-revolutionary West German capitalist parties, it is always possible to change the East German system from within the established political parties, including the Communist Party, as those parties were open to all and encouraged participation in the political process. The East German political system was actually more democratic than the West German one in at least two respects. In particular, one East Germany, only East Germany allowed voters to cast votes against the system, and thousands did so at each election. Now, let's take another brief look at the economic situations of both East and West Germany. In the first section of this video, I touched a little on this in my explanation of why the West was so much better off after World War II, which led to it becoming much richer than the East. But I'd like to expand on this a bit more. The most important tool used by the United States in the Cold War to help its allies um, grow and prosper economically was by providing aid to them. By making West Germany richer than East Germany, the USA was able to support its position that capitalism was better than socialism. Financial aid and capital from the USA was especially important in the economic reconstruction of West Germany in the years following World War II. On the other hand, the much poorer Soviet Union did not have sufficient wealth to offer East Germany. Instead, with their own country being wrecked by World War II, the Soviets required the East Germans to make enormous reparation payments as compensation for all the damage and killing that the unified Germany had committed. Even aside from the differences in damage inflicted by World War II on the Soviet Union and the USA, that being that the Soviets took much heavier losses to both soldiers and infrastructure, the Soviets had inherited a terribly poor country in 1917 when they first took power from the previous feudal leaders of Russia, with national income per capita equal to half that of the USA at the time, and they never could have offered the same assistance that the USA provided to the West Germans. As a result of the difference in economic standards, points of both the USA and USSR, as well as the post-war foreign economic assistance slash reparations, as documented more in depth in the first section of this video, West Germany very quickly became a much wealthier country. This situation provided West Germany with an excellent economic weapon which they used to strike at East Germany. In particular, the West German government provided working age East Germans who moved to West Germany with sufficient amounts of money and other benefits in order to emigrate to West Germany. For instance, free loans and other state assistances of up to 160,000 West German marks, about $100,000, were offered to each East German emigrant worker, along with a scarce apartment and reimbursement for any property that remained behind in East Germany. Along 
Uh, with all this in mind, it makes sense why the East Germany was losing skilled workers, which not only hurt their economy, but also forced them to build the Berlin Wall, as I described in the first er, section. Moreover, it should be noted that East Germany's national income grew in real terms about 2% faster annually than the West German economy between 1961 and 1989. In fact, the real growth rates in per, uh, in per capita income in East Germany reported by the Statistisches AMT were higher in every decade from 1950 to 1989 than those reported for West Germany by the Statistische Bundesamt. However, because of the very large reparation payments in, made by East Germany to the Soviet Union after World War II had caused it to start at a much lower level, it had not yet caught up by the 1980s, being only about two-thirds that of West Germany's at the time. In 1989, um, at the time... Another point about the East German economy is that the ratio of national income to capital stock rose from 7.2% in 1950 to 15.7% in 1989, despite an overall 10% drop in its population over that same time period, and despite the fact that the East German ca- uh, that the East German capital stock started out at a lower level because of capital seizures by the Soviet Union after World War II. This massive disparity in both con- in both the country's history found- slash foundation clearly explains why the West always appeared to be doing better economically than the East. They simply had more financial support and were treated much better during the post-war period. Finally, I'll end this video by discussing the exact reason for why the GDR collapsed. Like the Berlin Wall, the cause of the collapse of East Germany can be traced back to the income disparities of the two countries. As described in the previous sections, the income disparities between the two countries were caused almost wholly by how they were treated post-war. That being that the West didn't have nearly as much didn't have to pay nearly as much in reparations as the East, and the Soviet Union didn't have nearly as much money to spend on the GDR as the USA did to spend on the West. And even despite faster economic growth, the GDR was never able to catch up with the West in this regard. All of this, on top of the fact that West Germany was also providing massive incentives to Eastern Germans if they left, like above average income, preferential housing, enormous guaranteed loans, among others I've described previously. This alone not only caused mass migration from the east to the west, but was also an act of sabotage on the East German economy. By doing this, the West German puppets, as well as the USA, were able to claim that capitalism was a far superior system to socialism and cited Germany as a clear-cut example. This propaganda of an inferior socialist system and superior capitalist system allowed for enough East Germans to be convinced to vote in March 1990 for an end to their system. The ruling conservative parties in West Germany also used a combination of promises and threats to ensure electoral success. For instance, 10% annual real economic growth in the first two years after reunification was forecast if the conservatives won. In addition, because the permission of the conservative ruling parties in the West German parliament was needed for any reunification agreement or aid, they had a great deal of leverage to offer rewards, like a one-to-one exchange rate, for a vote favorable to capitalism and free trade, quote-unquote. A final factor influencing the March 1990 election results was a very destructive West German currency strategy. In return for limited economic aid, the West German government persuaded the East German government to change the official exchange rate from 1 to 1 to 3 East German marks for every one West German mark in January 1990, and to eliminate strict import and export controls. This action effectively reduced East German wealth and income by two-thirds, and totally demoralized the East German population, Many studies, il- as many studies illustrate. Then, in the week before the March election, the ruling West German parties promised a return to the one-to-one exchange rate, if it was elected. Many left-wing East Germans indicated that they voted for the right-wing political parties merely so that the money would come. Also, the importance 
of expensive marketing to defeat socialism in the GDR should not be underestimated. Through effective advertising, distribution, sales manipulation, and economic clout, and through gross exaggeration of the quality of problems for, co for communist products, a superior Western image was created. As a result, despite the fact that East German products were frequently demonstrated to be superior in unbiased scientific analysis, like taste tests without brand names, more expensive West German products were preferred. Also contributing to the rapid increase in West Germany's market share of the East German market shortly after it was opened up in 1990 was the normal practice of capitalist penetration pricing, whereby West German exports to East Germany were priced low enough to bankrupt East German competition. Once the East German firms, which in addition to suffering image problems also had inadequate liquidity, experience, and preparation for the capitalist competition, were bankrupted, prices were raised to West German levels in order to maximize West German corporate revenue profits. Some evidence of this phenomenon can be found in the fact that prices rose less rapidly in Eastern Germany than in Western Germany in 1990, whereas inflation in Eastern Germany was over 13% in 1991, compared to just 4% in Western Germany after the widespread bankruptcy of East German firms, which was reflected in the 40% decline in economic output in Eastern Germany in 1990 and 1991. So as you can hopefully see at this point, the fall of the GDR was because of unfair socioeconomic conditions as well as Western sabotage. So this will conclude this video on the GDR. All the sources for this will be in the description. Um, I hope you guys liked watching this and I also would like to thank you all for um, supporting me through the hacks and um, all the people who are trying to sabotage my account. I really appreciate the support and all the compliments I'm getting of my videos. Um, it really does make me feel better. So. Thanks for that, and uh, if you like this video, please give it a like, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.